Okay, so so what I want to do today is spend the time showing you or giving you the data, the scientific background of uh, the 21 years that we've been working on this compound uh, and uh, how we've been trying to develop it for use for cancer, and then uh, show you some of the more, uh, let's say, recent developments with this uh, also being used for viral infected cells as the title uh, belies. And then of course it's relevance to its use approval in India against SARS-CoV-2. So I will try to take you through this journey of 21 years in about 40 or 45 minutes uh, and try to explain it to those of you who do not have the same kind of oncologic background as some of the clinicians who are listening today uh, and try to combine the, uh, the, the talk so that all of you can uh, at least try to understand the most important points that I'm trying to make during this talk. So we should start first with uh, the problem that we started with 21 years ago. And that was the idea that within every solid tumor, there are cells that are resistant to either the treatment by chemotherapy or either the treatment by radiation therapy because those two standard treatments depend on replicating cells. Those cells have to be replicating in order for them to be sensitive to these types of treatments. But unfortunately, within every solid tumor, and for those of you who do not have a, a, a background, if you think of an egg, and you think of an egg as the white part of the egg are the rapidly dividing cells, but within every egg, there's a yolk, and those the yolk cells are the cells that are not actively dividing. We would call them uh, G0 cells in a state where they're just resting, or we would actually refer to them as stem cells. So in this slide here, you can see the whole tumor. This is the whole tumor with the in, in the side part or the inner core uh, where the uh, slow growing or G0 cells are, are there, which are resistant to the chemotherapy because they're not actively dividing. And the problem is that once the chemotherapy or radiation takes care of these outer red cells, because they are replicating, these cells remain. And if those cells remain, they can give rise to more cells that are going to be actively dividing, as well as to the most metastatic ones. So because you can also see here that these cells are in a low oxygen state, that's what this blueness uh, uh, depicts, those cells then become sensitive to the technique or the drug that we're going to be talking about today, uh, 2DG. And let me show you before I get started with the biochemical principles, just so that we're all familiar with the drug. 2DG is exactly like glucose, except on this two carbon, hence the name. Here's one carbon, number two carbon. 2-deoxyglucose is missing in the two carbon in the down position. It's missing the, the oxygen. Otherwise, it's exactly like glucose. So what that means is that the cell will take up 2DG just like it takes up glucose. The glucose transporters in the cancer cell that are taking up more because there are more glucose transporters in a cancer cell than a normal cell, they're taking up glucose through that transporter. And the first enzyme is called hexokinase, which phosphorylates glucose and traps it in the cell as a form of glucose 6-phosphate. Well, the same thing happens with 2DG. And so that becomes 2DG 6-phosphate. But because of that 2DG part, when doesn't have the oxygen, but has an hydrogen, it can't go any further. So by not going further, it, it itself can't uh, do anything as far as producing the energy that this process glycolysis uh, produces. But more importantly, it will block the enzyme for glucose to be able to use, to be able to be used to make energy for the cell. So it, what we call competitively inhibits this enzyme phosphoglucose isomerase and shuts down glycolysis. But as it builds up in the cell, it can also block allosterically, what we call allosteric inhibition. It can block this enzyme, hexokinase, and completely shut off glucose from even uh, being used in the cell. So what does this mean? For a cell that's not getting enough oxygen, as I showed you in the slide previously, uh, that means that those cells then have no way to make energy because by not having oxygen, 
they can't use what other cells could use if you do have oxygen. And uh, unfortunately, this is not showing. But if, if the oxygen is gone, yes, if the, ox if the oxygen is present in the cells, in normal cells, then you can use other energy sources like fat, fatty acids, and amino acids. So these are the three energy sources that we all have, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. But without oxygen, then the cell dies. Whereas those cells, even if, which most of our cells are, they're in the presence of oxygen, those cells will survive. And even if you got enough 2DG into those cells, they would use these energy sources to overcome that. So that's one of the big windows that we have in using this type of treatment. Now, here on the right-hand side, we're showing that 2 deoxyglucose gets in more to hypoxic cancer cells, more than cancer cells, and the cancer cells take up more than the normal cells. So we have this normal or natural window of selectivity of more 2DG getting into a hypoxic cell, more 2DG getting into a cancer cell, and the least getting into normal cells. So as I say, even if you got enough to block glycolysis in the normal cell, as long as you have oxygen, you can survive that, much like the Atkinson's uh, diet, where if you burn your glucose or you lower your glucose, you can now use um, fats and proteins in order to survive and lose weight. But that's not the point here. The point is that we have this nice selectivity, a natural selectivity that hypoxia offers us, the difference between cancer cells and normal cells, at least for those cells that are hypoxic. So that's what I'm gonna to talk to you right now and show you many experiments, but I'll only show you two. We did many, many experiments in many different types of cancer cells. So one of them that was uh, the first ones that we did, we took a cancer cell and instead of just put it in, putting it under hypoxia, we also uh, did two other things. We did either, we took the cell and gave it a chemical that blocked the usage of oxygen we call that a mitochondrial agent. In this case, it's rhodamine 123. So that was our chemical model of what we call quote unquote hypoxia or else anaerobic growth. That's another term. Or else uh, we, we actually got rid of the mitochondrial DNA. So that's our genetic model. And those cells then were still relying on glycolysis to survive. Well, down here, what you're looking at is survival. So dead cells in this up thing and showing that less than 10% cells. This one is the cancer cell that we did nothing to. And so it's the same cancer cell in all th three other uh, anaerobic models. And this last model is just putting the cells on the hypoxia. And so under no treatment with 2DG, no 2DG, they're all surviving quite well. So that means that under our models of anaerobiosis, the, the cells are, are doing fine, but they're using glycolysis. So once we give them to DG, those cells that are dependent on glycolysis die. And that was the first process that we had to show, at least in vitro, that our concept was working. And uh, this is just what we call a dose response or at higher doses. And as you can see, even in those cells that are what we call the nomoxa cells, nothing wrong with the mitochondria, there is a little bit of cell death. And I'll show you why in a couple of slides later. So now we take that concept and bring it to what happens in vivo or in animals. And working with one of the world's experts in a disease that causes retinoblastoma in children, which is the number one eye cancer in children, Dr. Tim Murray, he came to my lab and told me that in certain children that come in too late, he cannot save them with, by treating them with the treatments that he gives. And so one of the main treatments is carboplatin. And he thought, he thinks it's because uh, those, those uh, tumors are too large and they have too much hypoxia. So he wanted to study 2DG in collaboration with our lab to see whether or not 2DG could actually have effects, positive effects in combining it just like we thought and combining it with chemotherapy to try and get the whole tumor. And uh, he has a model uh, called the transgenic model of the disease, where by knocking out the most important genes that causes this, this disease, uh, retinoblastoma uh, gene, as well as the P53 gene, all the animals get retinoblastoma. And this is what it looks like in an untreated animal, 22 
months after, uh, 22 weeks after birth, they have a, a full complement of retinoblastoma. That's all the purple here. What you're looking at is the whole eye cornea lens, and then all of the purple is tumor. And then when he gives his, uh, his treatment with carboplatin, he reduces the tumor by about 50%, which is depicted here in the uh, quantitative measurement. Uh, and then when you give 2DG alone, you also reduce the tumor, but not completely. But when you give the combination of these two drugs, you get almost a completely normal retinal epithelium. Well, what's most important about this is the proof of principle that what we saw in vivo, uh, in vitro is working in vivo in animals. And so we use the drug called pimenidazole, which is commonly used and can be used. It's very non-toxic. It can be used in patients where you want to, if you want to look at a, a biopsy and see how much of that biopsy, how much of that tumor is containing hypoxic cells, then you can use this drug, uh, give it to the patient uh, 30 minutes before, and then do the biopsy. In this case, we did it with the animals that were being treated or untreated with 2DG or the carboplatin. And what we found is in the untreated animals, so A goes with A, there's plenty of hypoxia because uh, the green is what this uh, drug depicts when you do histochemistry. And so we see that as the hypoxic areas where those slow growing cells reside. And then this is a nice negative control to see that the carboplatin treated alone still leaves a lot of, of these slow growing cells that are uh, found in the hypoxic areas. But now when you treat with 2DG alone, you get rid of all those cells. And so what you're left with is rapidly dividing cells, but those slow growing hypoxic cells are gone. And then when you combine the treatment, you get almost a completely normal retinal epithelium. So this, this particular work kept me uh, invested in 2DG and saying, if we do it right and we know how to treat, finally, we know the best way to treat patients, this is worthwhile pursuing. So with that, we did get to a clinical trial, and I'm going to show you that in a minute, from the lab, from our ideas in the lab to patients. And then back to the lab after we found out what was working, what was not working so well as far as the delivery system. And then back into patients with the help of the two people that uh, Arpen talked to you about before. So um, the first part then was uh, from the lab, we got to a clinical trial, which was done here in Miami at the Sylvester Cancer Center in, in collaboration with other cancer centers. And we use 2DG in combination with Taxotere. And in the phase one trial, what we determined was the long-term treatment, long-term meaning these patients were drinking it once per day, and some of them drank it for over a year. And so it was very well tolerated at that, uh, and this type of treatment. So they took a bolus drink once per day and uh, displayed some activity, but in a phase one, you don't expect too much. All you expect is to be able to see, is it safe? And so we and also establish the highest dose you can give. And at uh, the point where we hit 63 milligrams per kilogram, we felt that the, we didn't want to go any further than that. Uh, but at that dose, we also got an insulin response. And as we know with glucose, when you get an insulin response, the insulin takes the glucose out of the blood and delivers it to fat and proteins. And so fat and muscles, I'm sorry. And so with that, we then hypothesized that perhaps then 2DG was not reaching the tumor as well by being delivered just by one, one day per drink. So we went back to the lab and what we did was we took animals and inserted slow surgically pumps that would slowly release 2DG much below the dose that would induce an insulin response. And what we found was that 2DG alone gave us a very nice control of the tumor by itself. So we were thinking then that this could be applied uh, in the clinic. And with the, uh, let's say fortunate, a very fortunate um, meeting that I had uh, with Dr. Daniel Stansu in the Netherlands, who had a lot of, um, uh, let's say he had a lot of experience with the many doctors that he was able to connect with for his own personal reasons, unfortunately. Uh, one of his loved ones had cancer. And so 
he was able to make many connections with doctors all throughout Europe. And uh, upon uh, us discussing this treatment that we published uh, in this uh, slide that I just showed you, uh, he said, why not try and do this as a compassionate use in the uh, patients that have no other alternative and have, uh, are in stage four? So that's how we started uh, in, in conjunction with Dr. Metten Kurtiglou, who was a, um, a graduate student of mine and then became a postdoc. Uh, and he had an MD degree in, my, in, in Turkey, uh, but he got his PhD degree in the University of Miami. And so he helped us in setting up the protocol, uh, which we now deliver, the protocol delivers 2DG in a slow infusion, 24 to 48 hours at low dose at uh, one to two grams per 100 ml. And we give this uh, protocol out to only to doctors who request it, not to patients because we believe that uh, the doctors uh, need to be able to be at least advising the patients on how to take the drug uh, to be safe. To date, we know of at least 25, and I'm sure there are a lot more, but at least we know of 25 uh, where they have taken it for periods up to two years and it's very well tolerated. Now we're talking about what we call metronomic or slow dose, uh, a delivery of 2DG. And that is done uh, by using what they call a continuous ambulatory delivery device, okay, CADD pump, which is used normally for uh, delivering drugs to cancer patients where they walk around with this pump, they can uh, use it for the 24 or 48 hours that they're, that they're taking the drug. And so far we have very positive effects, but they're anecdotal because it hasn't been done in a true clinical trial. It's just been done on patients who are taking other drugs. So it's hard to determine exactly how much uh, 2DG is contributing to the positive results we've seen in many of these patients that been treated with it. But most importantly, I will tell you from this the trial or the treatment that we've done so far is that we know that it's safe since we've not seen any significant side effects in the two years or so that some patients have taken it that long where they take it almost every week. Um, so I will just give you one uh, particular patient uh, that was quite remarkable because we knew that there were no other treatments before she began the 2DG, except she didn't want it when she was first diagnosed by the doctor for ovarian cancer, he found that it was metastasized not only to the ovarian place, but it was liver, spleen, and peritoneal cavity. And so he offered her chemotherapy, standard chemotherapy, and she didn't want to take it because she didn't want to suffer the consequences of chemotherapy. So he offered her 10 times lower dose, which is a, a, which is a treatment that done in some uh, a, a cancer centers where you, you treat the patient with 10 times lower uh, cisplatin and paclitaxel for ovarian cancer. And you, uh, you do that uh, by, in conjunction with uh, insulin. And uh, he offered her that treatment where he said, you won't feel any of the side effects at 10 times lower, but I'm going to also include metronomic 2DG as well as metformin. And within three months, it was quite remarkable that she showed a complete remission, not only in the ovarian mass, but all the metastases. This is one of our best uh, results. With that, uh, I will go on to show you some other data that uh, takes us to a completely different place. And that is, I showed you before how sensitive hypoxic cells are to 2DG. But then we, we, went, we went in a completely new um, direction with this unexpected result. And the unexpected result came again from the student in the lab, doctor, who is now a doctor, Metten Kurtiglou, who came to the lab and said he wanted to do a project in the lab. He was very interested in 2DG, uh, but he had no experience in, the lab, in laboratory procedures. He had an MD degree from Turkey, but had never worked in a lab. So I told him to go ahead and learn the techniques first, and then within a year or so time, come back to me, and then we would discuss a project. But within about seven or eight months, he came to me with this result. 
And the result is in certain cancer cells, this is a pancreatic cancer cell line, this is a breast cancer cell line. He showed me that cells treated in the presence of oxygen, these two cancer cell types are quite sensitive to 2DG at a low dose of 2DG, four millimolar. So he didn't know what to make of it. And I asked him, well, what do you think? And so he did come up with the idea that maybe these cells, maybe these particular cancer cell types are having a problem with their mitochondria, just like the genetic model we made. And so if they had problems with the mitochondrial DNA and they couldn't use oxygen, then maybe they were relying on glycolysis and that's why 2DG was killing them. In this process here, we're looking at 60% kill here and about 55 or 56% kill in this cell type at low dose 2DG. Most of the cells we had ever tested in the presence of oxygen never died. We never saw any death. So this was quite unusual. So in order to test the thought that he had, we went ahead and used a drug that we already knew. Uh, and that's, um, sorry for having this uh, slowness. Okay. So we already knew that this drug, floral deoxyglucose, was a better competitive inhibitor of glycolysis or uh, mimic glucose better than 2DG did. Why? Because the fluorine group electronically is more like a hydroxyl group of glucose than the hydrogen is in 2DG. So we went ahead and tested that, tested that with molecular models as well as in vivo, I mean in vitro, and showed that this was a better glycolytic inhibitor than 2DG. Knowing that, we went ahead and tested them and said, well, if it's a better glycolytic inhibitor, then it should have a more profound effect on those cells that you found were sensitive to 2DG in the presence of oxygen, if that's indeed the way they're killing them. But in fact, it didn't. And so this could not be the explanation that 2DG by blocking glycolysis was causing the cell death. It had to be something else. And so that something else then brought us back to the literature and looking in the literature, we found as early as 1979, a group headed by Schwartz in his laboratory that was studying 2DG. And they were studying how it incorporates fraudulently as a mannose analog into the growing uh, saccharide or um, uh, carbohydrate chain that is put on to proteins to make the, what we call the glycoprotein capsid of a virus. And so that's what they were looking at as early as 1979. And so we thought we would, could follow their work and try that in our cancer cells and see whether what they were finding was similar to what we were finding. So to just to uh, show you what mannose looks like, mannose is a natural sugar, as you know, uh, and comparing it to glucose is exactly the same, except the only difference is that hydroxyl group in the up position in mannose is in the down position in glucose. Otherwise, they're exactly the same. So to the oxyglucose, having a hydrogen in the up position and having a hydrogen in the down position can mimic not only glucose, but mannose. So one could refer to 2 deoxyglucose also as 2 deoxymannose Well, in the cell, what does that mean? That means that 2 deoxyglucose then could interfere with this process called N-link glycosylation, where the building up of sugars, uh, which starts here with what they call a dolical uh, anchor, where you start putting on sugars, and those sugars then, the first two are uh, called N-acetyl glucosamine, but the importance to us here was the mannoses are starting to be added here, and mannose is very important for the fully formed, which takes place in the endoplasmic reticulum, the fully formed, as that's an organelle in the cell, for those of you who don't know what the endoplasmic reticulum is. And it's a very important organelle in order to fold proteins correctly, as well as to fold glycoproteins, sugar proteins coming from the Greek glyco, uh, sugar. And so those sugars are then put onto a growing polypeptide chain inside the ER. And if those sugars are interfered with by 2DG, by interfering with mannose, because it looks like a mannose analog, this won't fold well, these sugars won't be correct, and the whole glycoprotein then will not be, uh, be able to be sent out and will start to accumulate and causing what we call 
ER stress, which is what's shown in the next slide. No, that's the end of the show. I didn't want that. Uh, so we'll go back to the next slide. Um, let's go back there. Or we can just show it like this. I think it's easier because I can, I should be able to, no, they don't, for some reason, I'm sorry, they don't seem to go uh, passing this way. Okay, so we should be able to transfer the slide here, go back. Okay, for some reason, this is- Yeah, so can you click on the bottom at- uh... Uh, Yeah, let me get rid of this. Yeah, if I can just get rid of this, um, discard changes. Yes, okay, so we should get back to the whole screen. Yes, okay, so, so with this, with this, um, with this um, understanding, with this understanding that 2DG could cause these, this interference, and causing what is known as ER stress, there's a system inside uh, the endoplasmic reticulum to sense this kind of damage, much like P53 senses DNA damage and tells the cell don't make any more DNA because there's a problem with the DNA. So it tells the cell cycle to stop. It tells the cell then to make more DNA repair enzymes. And if that doesn't work, then it eliminates the cell by P53 mediated apoptosis. Well, similar to that, for unfolded proteins causing ER stress, the unfolded protein response, which is made up of PERC, ATF6, and IR1, what this does is first PERC uh, phosphorylates what is known as EIF2-alpha, which is the initiator of cap-dependent protein synthesis. It tells the so cell to stop protein, stop making these proteins because it cannot handle anymore. And so, Similar then, it does also, instead of uh, inducing DNA repair enzymes like P53, it induces more folders, what, what are called chaperones or folders in the form of GRP78 and GRP94, which I'll show you in a minute. And then if that doesn't work, it tells the cell, eliminate, eliminate this cell uh, because it's, it's not re being repaired properly. And it does it by what is known as unfolded protein response mediated apoptosis. And that's exactly what happens if there's too much 2DG cannot be repaired. And so with this understanding, uh, we hypothesized then what 2DG was doing was interfering initially with this growing polypeptide, growing oligosaccharide chain. And that was causing misfolded proteins, which would induce ER stress, would induce uh, unfolded protein response. And if that was not repaired in those cells that are sensitive, that's what was causing the cell death and not the inhibition of glycolysis. And the two people that were instrumental in this work is Met and Kurt Aglou and John Mayer, both graduate students in my lab. And so I'll take you quickly through this. Uh, so the first part was done in collaboration with uh, Mark Lerman at the University of Southwestern Texas, where he is the, if he's not the world leader in looking at carbohydrate uh, oligosaccharide synthesis, uh, he's one of the leaders in the world and using a technique called FACE, uh, which does not use radioactivity. So he's able to do this without using uh, radioactive precursors. And he's able to show in our sensitive cells when we sent them our uh, work, he was able to show that at low dose in those sensitive cells, the fully formed, what we call the fully formed oligosaccharides or G3M9 with nine manoses was completely or almost completely interfered with. So it's no longer looking like the untreated cells. So here's untreated with 2DG and here's the fully formed uh, G3M9 almost completely gone. Whereas the resistant cells that most of the cell types that we look at are resistant are doing quite well and not affected. So that was our first indication that we were on the right track. And so we went on to go ahead and look at ER stress and see whether or not the uh, stress markers were up. So uh, doing a simple Western blot where you can actually look at the levels of these proteins, we were able to see that this protein, GRP94 and GRP78, both of them ER stress markers are up as compared to control. 
And then interestingly, we could not reverse this with glucose. So if it was, if it was mimicking glucose and blocking glycolysis, we, we should be able to re reduce that. We couldn't, but with mannose, we could do it very nicely. So that was a, another step in the right direction as far as saying, it's not because 2DG is blocking glycolysis, but it's because it's interfering as a mannose analog. And so the next step was to go ahead and look at the cell death and see whether we could reverse uh, the cell death by co-treating the cells with mannose. So in this case, we're not co-treating with anything in the 1420 or the SKB3, uh, SKBR3, and both cell types are quite sensitive to 2DG as we knew, but when we co-treat with mannose, we get rid of the toxicity. Again, just like we, we looked at with the mannose reversal uh, for the GRP78 and GRP94, showing that the cells are completely uh, uh, no longer sensitive because we, we competed with mannose. If we try to compete with either glucose or fructose or fucose, uh, we can't do it. So again, the, uh, pointing to the idea that 2DG is working as a mannosol analog and not as a glucose analog in these cells that are sensitive. And uh, two years later, there was a paper published uh, by Dr. Panito in her lab where she looked at a whole group of rhabdomyosarcoma cells and found the similar thing that were all sensitive to 2DG under normoxia. And then uh, she went ahead and did the experiment and tried to reverse with mannose. And here she's showing mannose alone didn't do any, anything to the cell. Uh, 2DG alone was killing almost 60% of the cells. And then when she co-treated with mannose at either one or five millimolar, she completely reduced it, much like our experiments showed the same thing. And then uh, we went on to collaborate here with Dr. Burrito, who's an expert in treating children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia and found the same thing in T cells and B cells having acute lymphoblastic leukemia. They're also sensitive to 2DG under normoxia the B cells more sensitive than the T cells, and then able to re re reverse this again with mannose. So then a similar thing that we had originally found in those two cancer cells uh, that I showed you. And then another report in 2015 in another disease called acute my myeloid leukemia, where uh, 2DG again was shown to do the same thing. So now this is, seems like in certain tumor cells, even in the presence of oxygen, Tumor, a, a 2DG can kill them by the mannose pathway or by interfering or mimicking the mannose pathway. So, so with this idea, fortunately, my lab was down the hallway from one of the world's experts in Carposi's sarcoma and how it's driven by the sarco Carposi's sarcoma herpes virus. So, so car Carposi's sarcoma is the number one cancer in AIDS patients. That's what they suffer. But it's not driven by the AIDS uh, virus. It's driven by the Carposi's sarcoma herpes virus. And so in talking to Dr. Mesri, Enrique Mesri, who is, uh, who is the person down the hallway who's been studying this for many years, I, he talked to me about how viruses, when they get in and use these envelope viruses, because herpes is an envelope virus, how it gets in and uses the ER, it's making a lot of viruses and the cell before it got infected was only doing a certain amount of ER uh, uh, utilization. So this causes a lot of stress in the endoplasmic reticulum because there's too many proteins being, being used or processed. So they had to have a way to circumvent what we know now, the PERC or the uh, unfolded protein response. So they they don't phosphorylate it, they do not block EIF2-alpha, and they make all these proteins. Otherwise, if they blocked it, they couldn't make the viruses. So the viruses had to come up with a way to overcome this ER stress that they caused. Well, we thought simply then, why not give those cells that are being affected by the virus or pre-treat them with 2DG and see co-treat them or pre-treat them and see whether the ER stress that we could cause with 2DG would go ahead and phosphorylate PERC and block further protein synthesis and then block viral replication. And indeed, that's exactly what we found. And uh, I'll show you those couple of slides where we actually showed, I'm sorry, this went down again. 
we, we actually showed this to occur. So in this particular slide, we're looking at the ER stress markers. In this case, we're looking at phospho EIF2 alpha and showing that it's upregulated compared to uh, no 2DG or no FDG. When we do it with FDG, we don't see much of a change, a little bit, but not much, not nearly as much as 2DG. And then when we look at GRP78, unfolded protein response marker, we are also seeing a, a nice upswing in the GRP, but very little by fluoro deoxyglucose. Again, fluoro deoxyglucose is doing a little, little bit more than untreated alone. 